Sensing that something is wrong with the world, a young person today seems to face two options. Do something to change what's wrong, or try to mitigate its effects. If climate change threatens the existence of the species, then at once we should march in protest, or demand that universities de-invest from fossil fuels, or pressure the state to invest in large-scale energy transition programs. The first option is activism. However, when activism runs up against walls, and these walls have a very deep history, a young person might instead seek satisfaction in the effects of a problem they don't understand. This second option, where we psychologize the effects of an impenetrable social and political reality, is spreading like wildfire under the slogan of harm reduction. When, where when, activism where act turns outward, harm reduction turns inward. And yet they have a common root in the nihilism of a society no longer willing to think its own next step. Harm reduction is becoming the political lens through which pre-professional youth on college campuses view climate change and life generally. As a policy proposal, however, it has its origin in the drug, e drug epidemic. For the past 50 years of neoliberalism, the policy of the capitalist state toward antisocial drug abuse was that of repression, the drug wars and the prison complex. Now, with the unsteady shift to post-neoliberalism, signaled by Trump siding with Kim Kardashian to scale back the Reagan-Clinton crime bill, the emphasis from progressive Democrats is no longer repression, but care. Rather than locking up the despondent crack and fentanyl dependent, if we provide safe needles and safe pipes in an administered setting, perhaps those whose, lo whose destroyed lives have become psychologized through drug abuse can catch enough of a glimpse of happiness to make the transition to everyday work reality. Now to the drug crisis in America and a practice known as harm reduction. Advocates say the hard truth is simply that many people who abuse drugs likely won't stop. So they try to make drug use safer by offering clean needles and life-saving Narcan. I'll tell you right now, it is a horrible idea. It is an idea where you're encouraging drug use instead of preventing drug use. And it's the, it's the mindset of low expectation. I don't see how... If harm reduction defines the horizon of progressive democracy, then it sets itself up only for a swing back to repression. Everybody knows that whether it's applied to the drug epidemic or to global warming, harm reduction is a band-aid designed to mask and postpone the bigger crash. But this swing back and forth between care and repression is not arbitrary. The Enlightenment thinker Friedrich Schiller diagnosed that failure to realize the pursuit of happiness would mean humanity's permanent stunting in a state of childhood. We would perpetually swing back and forth between savagery and barbarism. The savage lets loose his passions. The barbarian imposes order. The savage says, let people do crack and fentanyl. They're looking for a better life. The barbarian says, society demands they stop. They can go no further. The savage advocating passion and care and the barbarian advocating order and repression did not by themselves define the horizon of the Enlightenment, since it was concerned with humanity's maturing into adulthood by overcoming this back and forth in a positive way. Today, though, harm reduction has been trans transposed from the drug epidemic to the climate crisis, and it is here that its self-defeating psychologization of the problem it avoids becomes painfully acute. Across college campuses, therapeutic struggle sessions are being hosted where students voice the trauma imposed by imagining the end of the world. These therapy sessions for the pre-professional elite are the managerial vanguard of climate austerity. As Matt Huber argues, the professional class bloated under neoliberalism psychologized climate change as climate guilt in the context of consumerism and exchange preferences. The damaged children of the guilt-ridden professionals are now hosting arts and crafts sessions under the new slogan of harm reduction. And not even to reduce harm, but to get kids to advocate reducing harm, so that pre-professional children become the means of a means which has itself become its own end. If the psychological harm of imagining the end of the world has become an end in itself for our professional classes, then perhaps a reconsideration of historical means and social ends is in order. If not, perhaps the right will actually take up the climate austerity long propounded by the left, and the pendulum will swing back to repression. What we'll see in the following is that the pursuit of happiness undercuts and critiques the nihilism of both reactive activism and self-subduing harm reduction. 
But first, the pursuit of happiness does not mean the mere quantitative increase of gratification and stimulation. Indeed, the refuge taken in stimulation and gratification is part and parcel of the hollowing out and deadening of experience. By contrast, bourgeois enlightenment, Karl Marx and Theodore Adorno, all held up happiness as a critical category. What happiness proposes is the ability to transform our own nature, or freedom. By pursuing happiness, we hold out hope that our own collective and individual self-domination is not the end of the story. This pursuit is a critical insight. Panning out from this little tale, we can see how the reversal of means and ends from the bourgeois enlightenment of the 18th century to its industrialized socialization in the 19th century opened up the next step in human history. Originally, humanity was going to free itself from agricultural slavery by means of property and pleasure. We recognized that property was just a product of cooperative labor and that pleasure was simply good. These were radical revolutionary insights, and under their banner, all agricultural civilizations fell one by one into one industrial world society. But this original insight that property and pleasure were a means to happiness got turned on its head because it released demonic potentials that outstripped its comprehension. Instead, property and pleasure became ways of dominating humanity and its aborted transition to socialism. We can see how this reversal plays out in three steps. First, the original intent. Second, how realizing this original intent results in a reversal. And finally, what happens when we do not think through this reversal, but instead suppress it and invest ourselves in its effects. First, the emancipatory intent at the beginning. When you hear private property, the first thing you should think of is owning your own labor. Property in labor, not mere possessions. What you should hear is cooperative labor, since it was the cooperation of labor that gave rise to private property. Pretend I'm a single craftsman who owns my own labor, my tools, and my land. Already as a single craftsman making shoes, I have to exchange those shoes for other things, be it the leather to make them or bread to eat. Already owning my own labor means that I'm participating in a division of labor, and that division of labor is constituted by exchanging its products. This division, this division of labor by means of exchange was not the self-imagination of agricultural civilization. It was a radical demythologization and denaturalization of all civilization. What is society if not the cooperative effort of labor? It is only with bourgeois private property, classes of labor cooperating by exchanging, that a concept of society emerges at all and throws agricultural civilization in the dustbin. By cutting away all the mythological rationalizations for age-old injustice and irrationality, by reducing civilization to its roots in the mere cooperation of labor, the revolution meant to get beyond it. By this same token, by freeing labor to cooperate in a division of labor, the radical bourgeois imagination was to enable humanity to reattain its natural freedom. It was a radical step by thinkers like Locke and Kant to see in the senses themselves a pleasure that tempted, tested, and tried the boundaries of understanding. If happiness will not be postponed by the intellect to an indefinite and unreachable future, then the five senses must themselves show the way and this daring proposal of discovery is the basis of modern science. The common litany of agricultural civilization, wherever you look, is suffering, and the radical bourgeoisie declared that suffering is not the natural lot of humanity. Indeed, the wildest fantasies of religion are projections of humanity, of their lot onto a cold, dead universe. And these images carry with them the pain and hope of their birthmark. To say that humanity was meant for pleasure, not suffering, was once upon a time a battle cry against the manifest and manifold irrationalities of human existence. Two, these two propositions, however, 
property and pleasure experience a reversal once they're actually realized in industrialization. Rather than being a means to happiness, property becomes a means of class domination and pleasure a means of individual self-domination. The unique genius of the 19th century, Karl Marx, is the one to recognize this reversal. Considering first property and labor, because labor owned itself and cooperated on the basis of exchange, its division among the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker would expand and include ever more humanity in a virtuous cycle of increasing wages, lower profits, shorter working hours, reinvestment, and more and better goods for everybody. The workers in a pen factory owned the product of their labor because with their wages they could participate in the larger division of labor by purchasing all of its products. The fact that one man owned the pen factory did not mean that labor did not own itself. Who cares who owns a pen factory so long as he invests its profits towards employing more people and as long as those employed worked less and for more? Free labor was reinvesting itself in an expansive way. The owner of the pen factory, the guy who supplied the tools, was just a means to the self-expansion. However, as soon as property and labor was realized, it became the opposite of itself. By investing itself in machines, labor made itself irrelevant and undermined its own cooperation. The workers went from being the subject, using their own tools, to being themselves the tools of the factory. Now, as labor became increasingly obsolescent in the machines it built, the owners of those machines became a class standing against those who owned nothing but their own labor. This class conflict between those who own their own labor and those who own the means for employing labor was a result of the deeper reversal where labor became the tool of the very tools it had created. As Marx put it, the capitalist, the owner of machines, is a peculiar general who marshals his army by discharging it. The machines themselves had made labor, their masters, superfluous. A similar reversal takes place at the level of pleasure. The radical bourgeois enlightenment thought that releasing reason as a force in the world would enable humanity to liberate itself from the dregs of civilization and reattain the freedom that was its natural condition and right. This is the difference between animal nature and civilization. By civilizing ourselves through agricultural slavery, we suppressed our animal nature and made it into something different, something possibly more. This something more was the possibility of pleasure. The animal doesn't experience pleasure. It is merely driven by impulse, the satisfaction of need. It is compelled to copulate. When we suppressed our impulse and instinct in civilization, the energy and drive behind that instinctual impulse got reflected at a higher level. This object was attached in mythology to religion and the happiness denied to the slaves was imitated in the aristocratic culture of the ruling caste. The bourgeois revolution, by liberating humanity from agricultural slavery, sought to redeem this repressed instinct by making pleasure an end in itself. It would be open-ended, as daring as Galileo, Columbus, and Jefferson. The pleasure of living and being alive would be an open task that guided humanity beyond the brutality of its agricultural state. However, just as free labor became doubly free wage labor, where you're free to choose your job, but also free from the means of existence without a job, where labor became enslaved to its own industrial tools, or what many in the 19th century termed wage slavery, so too did the pleasure of living itself become a means to labor. If our animal impulse, repressed by civilization, was to be reachieved through social cooperation as pleasure, as the attempt to explore and test the boundaries of our own senses, then this possible freedom, pleasure as an end in itself, got reduced to mere stimulation and gratification. Merely being alive became a means to working, rather than working becoming a means to living. Stimulation and gratification became the only way the worker could feel himself free away from labor at the same time as labor became mere drudgery. Or as Marx put it, what is animal becomes human 
and what is human becomes animal. If the workers became mere tools of the industrial machine, then the lives of those workers became means to reproducing them as workers. 3. This reversal of property and pleasure from means to happiness to means of self-domination was not supposed to be the end of the story. If the bourgeois cooperation of labor had come to contradict itself, if a class divide was opening up between those who owned their labor and those who owned the means of employing labor, if labor had become the tool of its tools and life itself the means of reproducing labor as a tool, then labor would have to work through this contradiction by freeing both itself and the tools that dominated it. The task of prosecuting this contradiction is what Marx called socialism. But when we missed this opportunity for consciousness and went cascading down the wrong timeline of the totalitarian 20th century instead, this original contradiction was itself suppressed and our original hopes got invested instead in fetishizing its effects. This deep problem, the missed opportunity, and the refusal to think it is what lies behind the two bad options of reactive activism and self-subduing harm reduction. To put it in an image, the class contradiction between labor and its tools got submerged into a monopoly machine that doled out both labor and pleasure like rations. The monopolies, whether big oil or big tech, are themselves a product of cooperative labor. But as a product, they hand out jobs and pleasure to the masses as a way to keep themselves in existence. So the class contradiction recedes into the background and everybody is paid out of monopoly super profits, whether corporate welfare or state welfare. As Adorno put it, the omnipotence of repression and its invisibility are the same thing. The classless society of car drivers, cinema goers, and comrades makes a mockery not only of those who do not belong, but of those who do, the objects of domination who dare not admit as much to others, or even to themselves, because simply knowing one is such an object is punished by gnawing fear for one's job and one's life. The dominant centers of the culture industry, Wall Street, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, Harvard, and DC, make sure that everybody stays in line. As Adorno put it, the individual has been, as it were, merely invested with property by the class, and those in control are ready to take it back as soon as universalization of property seems likely to endanger its principle, which is precisely that of withholding. Psychology repeats in the case of properties what was done to property. It expropriates the individual by allocating him its happiness. So rather than thinking through this problem, we become invested in our pathology, the happiness allocation by the monopoly machine itself. Instead of sexual freedom, we substitute mental health. Instead of exploration, pharmacology. Big tech systematically harvests kids' attention, and then big pharma gets them hooked on literal meth and SSRIs, increasingly via telehealth, which during COVID got 5.5 billion in startup and advertising directly to consumers via TikTok immediately prescribes and ships. This pharmacologization on demand started in the 1970s when we started mass producing Prozac. And then each new generation comes to identify with its own pathology because this pathology is the happiness allocation by which everybody can feel part of collective authority. Adorno diagnoses this as an all-pervasive narcissism. Quote, Terror before the abyss of the self is removed by the consciousness of being concerned with nothing so very different from arthritis or sinus trouble. Thus, conflicts lose their menace. They are accepted, but by no means cured, being merely fitted as an unavoidable component into the surface of standardized life. At the same time, they are absorbed as a general evil by the mechanism directly identifying the individual with social authority, which has long since encompassed all supposedly normal modes of behavior. Catharsis, unsure of success in any case, is supplanted by pleasure at being, in one's weakness, a specimen of the majority. And rather than gaining, like inmates of a sanatorium in former days, 
the prestige of an interesting pathological case. One proves on the strength of one's very defects that one belongs, thereby transferring to oneself the power and vastness of the collective. Narcissism, deprived of its libidinal object by the decay of the self, is replaced by the masochistic satisfaction of no longer being a self, and the rising generation guards few of its goods so jealously as its selflessness, its communal and lasting possession. To conclude, we'll return to the drug epidemic and global warming, which are increasingly being approached through the lens of harm reduction. In each case, we can be caring and try to ameliorate the reality of addiction and carbonization without addressing its cause. Or we can be stern and try to bring down the hammer on this cause with police state, drug wars, or climate austerity. For Schiller, Hegel, and Goethe's enlightenment comrade, the swinging back and forth between caring and sternness is what happens when we stop thinking. Failure to realize this promise of enlightenment for Schiller would mean a perpetual swing back and forth between savagery and barbarism. The savage lets loose his passions, lets them do drugs, the barbarians dance them down, order must be imposed. In neither case will the cost of civilization be redeemed. A first step is to recognize the problem, the inability to even begin to think. Facing the utter bankruptcy of activism and the mortal dead end of harm reduction, behind which stands the policeman's club, we should deinvest from our pathology and dare to think. Daring to think does not mean offering immediate prescriptions on what to do. The false urgency of just tell me what to do is what leads to reactive activism and harm reduction in the first place. Instead, by simply showing what's been done before and what we're continuing to do, it opens up the possibility of doing something different. In other words, daring to think is happiness. As Adorno wrote to the anti-authoritarian New Left students who canceled him, whatever has once been thought can be suppressed, forgotten, can vanish, but it cannot be denied that something of it survives. For thinking has the element of the universal. What once was thought cogently must be thought elsewhere by others. This confidence accompanies even the most solitary and powerless thought. Whoever thinks is not enraged in all his critique. Thinking has sublimated his rage. Because a thinking person does not need to inflict rage upon himself. He does not wish to inflict it on others. The happiness that dawns in the eye of the thinking person is the happiness of humanity. The universal tendency of oppression is opposed to thought as such. Thought is happiness even where it defines unhappiness by enunciating it. By this alone, happiness reaches into universal unhappiness. Whoever does not let it atrophy has not resigned. <laughs>